much appreciation to Gunter Lange for um, you know, continuing to move this forward and come up with a great idea and concept of being able to um, have our seminar um, during the daytime and during the championships instead of at the end. And many people have talked about this, but uh, Gunter, thanks a lot for having me again. And also to Doct uh, Professor Dr. Ulrich Hartmann, who in the last three years has really kind of taken me under his wing. He's been at IMG Academy a couple different times lecturing at the, um, for the IAAF Academy on endurance and, and that type of thing. And I've really learned a lot with him and especially just dialoguing over parts of this presentation. Um, and I hope that many of you were able to attend his endurance lecture on uh, the first day of the, the conference. And much appreciation to the coaches and the scientists, the athletes who have chosen to spend the morning with us. Um, congratulations on your dedication. And um, I'm hoping that some of the information that Raina and I will share um, you can put to use uh, in your very next training session. Um, that said, um, if you have a question, raise your hand, and when I take a pause to breathe, I'll, uh, I'll try to recognize you. It's better to get the answers to your questions at that time rather than try to save them up to the end and then maybe forget or we run out of time. So please don't be shy. Um, I, but I do have a disclaimer to make. I am not a scientist, okay? Um, Dr. Hartman is a scientist. So I am a coach. And um, as a coach, I am a teacher. And so I want to teach my athletes so that they understand why they're doing what they're doing and how it's going to get them to the finish line faster. And I also have for a long time believed in uh, coach education. Charles Van Kove and I and I were talking about how many different countries in the world I've had an opportunity to lecture in. And it's a sizable number. And I'm, uh, you know, again, very grateful for that. Um, science helps <clears throat> with coaching, but coaches aren't scientists typically. And I heard Jeremy Fisher say this one time and, and really resonated with me is that as coaches, you have to try to know everything about everything. Okay, it's a, it's a daunting task, but unless you really arm yourself with a huge database, you don't have necessarily the way to see the next path or the new changes or what's happening in training or how to get your athlete off of a plateau onto the next level. <clears throat> there are certain preconditions that um, individuals have to have in order to be successful in sprinting. Some are more difficult to develop than others. But if you look at all of the great sprinters, and I'm talking about 100 meters and 400 meters today, um, they all have very highly um, specific muscle fibers. Um, and it's not just the type two or the fast twitch fibers. It's the fastest fast twitch fibers. And these are, these are uh, heavy chain myosin. The structure of the myosin uh, molecule is such that it contracts much quicker than its lighter chain fast twitch uh, brethren. And so understanding what promotes the development of heavy chain myosin, and even more important, what detracts, how, can you, how you actually change the, the myosin structure in your muscle and make it a lighter chain and consequently not as high a velocity of fibers. They also have a higher percentage of these types of fibers. The amount of functional muscle mass is greater. Now, the key point here is functional. If you're looking good for the beach, and you've developed your upper body to a high extent, unless you run on your hands, it's probably not going to help you. If you got to carry it around, it is a problem. And so the equation for vertical velocity, and we're not going to write it down, counts weight 
twice. So if you gain one kilo of non-functional muscle mass or fat, that's the other one, you have to produce two kilos more force. And so if you're a, if you're a female sprinter running 1096 and you add five kilos, you run 1129. Pretty simple, just physics. And so this is becoming a, a fairly important part in terms of training of sprinters, and especially female sprinters, in terms of the athletes that have a tendency, when they look at a, um, a, a barbell, they put on muscle. So in the construction of your strength training programs, it's real important to monitor that. They have a very, very high rate of lactic acid formation. And consequently, they have very high glycolytic power. And we're going to spend a little bit of time drilling down and looking at the difference between highly trained and untrained 100 meter runners relative to where does the energy come from. They're able to handle high loads. And what I mean was when, you, when you're traveling at 12 meters per second and your foot hits the ground, going nine meters per second backwards, there's a tremendous load that you have to tolerate. Anthropometrics can be an advantage. Now, we have had um, great short sprinters of short stature and, of course, of tall stature. But one of the myths, and I heard it again last night on the television, um, speaking about the women's 200, um, our defending 400-meter champion from uh, Bahamas, um, they said, well, she's not a good starter because she's tall. It makes a big difference if you're tall. It's easier to be a top-level sprinter if you're taller, if your leg length is greater than if you're shorter. Because what ends up happening is you have to rely too much on frequency. And for example, I've had a chance to coach Andre Kaysen and Travis Paget. Both of them will tell you they're 5'7", or about 1 meter 70. They're not telling the truth. But in order to run 9'8", and in Kaysen's uh, standpoint, a windy 9'7", 9, they have to turn over at 5.1, um, 5.2 steps per second. This is like a sewing machine. Now, if you look at Usain Bolt and his run in Berlin, he was turning over at about 4.78 steps per second. For a shorter sprinter with shorter legs in order to uh, generate that kind of velocity, almost 12.5 meters per second, you have to run 5.37 steps per second. I've never seen that happen. And so the other thing is, you know, in the world record run, people say, well, Bolt, you know, he's not a good starter. He was second place, one one hundredth of a second behind Asafa Powell at 10 meters. Every time he goes through a range of motion and pushes, he travels further because his leg length is much greater. And in starting, you don't want to have a big air time. The air time on the first step is 0.05 to 0.07 seconds. Because it would be true, wouldn't it? If I'm on the ground sooner than you are and you're flying through the air, I'm accelerating sooner. How much force can you put into the ground when you're flying through the air? Zero. So leg length really is an advantage to the sprinter as long as they have the strength in order to be able to produce the forces. Extremely good neurophysiology, uh, physiological abilities is, is important. And we're going we're gonna, to, again, amplify some of these as we, as we move forward. High mechanical efficiency. We need to re have high economy in sprinting. This is extremely important in the 400. Superior sprint technique, not only at the start, not only during acceleration, but also maximum velocity. And of course, 
the athlete with, the strong, with a higher level of mental strength has a tremendous advantage. So neural conductance velocity, the speed at which the, the signal is being sent, not only down the motor nerve, but back through the sensory system, because you have to have this loop. High level sprinters are basically running off reflex. So when they put their foot on the ground, that signals up and down. And basically, you've got a loop that runs in an automa uh, automated motor pattern. <clears throat> They're able to recruit the largest motor, motor units very, very quickly, very soon. And these large motor units are almost always the fastest motor units. The concept of pre-innervation pre is real important. What pre-innervation is, is that you can think of it as anticipatory firing. So when I'm, when I'm going to hit the ground, I don't wait till I hit the ground to send the message down. I have to advance the spark such that the muscle is already starting to contract. You might not have movement, but is starting to contract when you hit the ground. This increases the ability to have that bounce. A study by, um, uh, who involved a good colleague of ours, Ralph Mushbahani at the University of Freiburg, showed that um, the fastest sprinters, before they, before they uh, leave the ground, are already dorsiflexing their foot. They're sending messages down to dorsiflex the foot, which facilitates the recovery of the, of the thigh moving forward. We're going to talk about the concept of co-contraction and foot firmness a little bit later. Reactive power, or in the US we call it elastic strength, the ability to store elastic energy in the contractile and the non-contractile portions of the muscle. And we're going to talk about, um, in one slide, how can we manipulate connective tissue. Trunk stability is extremely important. I was just talking with Helena Duplantis, the mother of Mondo Duplantis, about the challenges of running and sprinting as fast as you can holding a pole. Trunk stability really is necessary in this, in this type of an action. Intramuscular and intramuscular coordination. This is where we're going to talk about co-contraction. Co but just very briefly, to be able to use the intramuscular coordination, the stretch shortening cycle, in order to maximize the recruitment of motor units. And then arm and leg coordination. For many years, biomechanists said, well, the arms just basically uh, balance what the legs do. But some of the best biomechanists in the world now are admitting, yes, if you have a faulty arm action and you change it, you can have positive effects relative to what's happening in terms of your legs. Just a little example. If you, sh if you show me a sprinter that comes out of the starting block and their arm is way long back here like this, I can tell you automatically they're over pushing. They're pushing so much that they're continuing extension while they're in the air. And so by basically stopping the arm and getting them to change direction and punch it forward, you're facilitating recovery of the leg on the opposite side. And then last but certainly not least is where does the energy come from? And that's where we're going to start today. When I was studying exercise physiology at the University of Wisconsin in 1972, I know, I don't look it. Um, yeah, Gunter said I've been coaching for 45 years. He forgot to tell you that I was three years old when I started. <clears throat> this confused me so much, this diagram. And what I thought happened is, 
you shift gears and you're in, in ATP, and then that stops, and then you go to CP, and then you, you know, your glycolytic kicks in third gear, and finally your fourth gear is your oxidative metabolism. In point of fact, it's all happening at the same time. All systems are working at the same time. What they don't tell you is this, is this is the percentage that that particular energy system contributes in that time frame. So you can see in kind of the, the 10 second range, we're predominantly going to get our energy from stored ATP and stored creatine phosphate. But we're still producing, I mean, y'all are producing lactate while you're sitting here. Otherwise your blood lactate wouldn't be 0.4 to 0.7. But the intensity, of the, the intensity of the activity is going to determine how hard we kick in. And then, of course, oxidative metabolism. This is, again, something that in the last 10 years relative to 400-meter um, running has changed a lot in terms of, of what we know. So volitional muscle contraction, you're going to send a message down, and that action potential is going to cross the junction, and it's going to release calcium um, into, the, into the space. And this is going to then start a cascade of events that causes muscle contraction. The calcium portion is really important here, okay? To understand that calcium is involved in those initial steps of muscle contraction. In terms of mechanism of contraction, You've got the link between the actin and hopefully heavy chain myosin. And when this particular compound, troponin, works with ATP or adenosine triphosphate, magnesium is also required. It causes these um, two molecules, actin and myosin, to bind and to ratchet together. Consequently, the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Key point here, magnesium is required and we're going to figure out where else magnesium is required because 30 years ago the Navy SEALs did a ton of studies on strength and one of the things they did was they intentionally depleted magnesium from some of the SEALs until it was down to a ridiculously low level and they monitored the ability to produce force during this time. The more magnesium deficient the seal was, the weaker they were. And so one of the things, particularly in hot environments, is you lose electrolytes, magnesium is one of the ones that you lose. And even if you're drinking Gatorade, you're not going to replenish it because there are very few drinks that contain magnesium because it tastes nasty. So this is one thing that you want to get with your, with your uh, doctors and your, your nutritional experts to make sure that your athletes are in the right zone, particularly with some of these uh, small minerals. We can talk about the energy share, and this is, uh, um, I, I take this term and, uh, from Uli Hartman the energy share that's required in each different event. The energy share that's required in the 100 meters is different than the energy share that we're going to see in the 400 meters. Now, we're going to talk primarily about three energy systems. The first one is the, uh, the anaerobic A-lactate, where we're working with ATP. By the way, if you don't have ATP, muscle contraction stops. It's the job of all of the other energy systems to rebuild the ATP molecule. And the creatine, uh, creatine phosphate liberating the energy is one of the ways that we rebuild that ATP such that muscle contraction can continue. Now, what the heck is the third one? If you look at most basic uh, exercise physiology books, they don't talk about this. There are some special cats out there that when you start 
to get high concentrations of ADP in the, in the muscle because of ATP breakdown, they can take two ADP, adenosine diphosphate molecules, they smash them together in what's called the adenylate reaction, and you come out with an ATP and an AMP, adenosine monophosphate. This is not cyclic AMP. This is just AMP. Cyclic AMP controls a lot of the processes of the cell. We're going to talk a lot more about this and, and the implications of this, particularly in our 400 meter runners. So ATP resynthesis, when we look at rest, you've got the top, uh, the top cycle where we're in, the pro we're in the process of rebuilding the ATP, and that cycles around. Creatine is involved with that. And now you see the, uh, during the bottom is the exercise, where creatine is going to lend its energy to rebuild the ATP. Now, thank you again to Dr. Hartman for allowing me to borrow this slide, um, because you who are here Monday probably recognize it. What you see is, is that ATP stays relatively high during the course of the 100 meters in, with high intense exercise. However, creatine phosphate drops off significantly. And when you start to get in that 10 second range, you can see that available ATP is less. This is one of the metabolic considerations for why we have a speed maintenance phase in that last phase before the finish in our 100 meter uh, race model. So why did I call it the speed maintenance phase? What happens during this phase to the velocity of the athlete? They decelerate. Well, why don't we call it the deceleration phase? If you call it the deceleration phase, your athletes will not disappoint you. This is a concept of neurolinguistics. We want to talk about and name things about what we want to have happen, not what we want to avoid. And so in these last phases, you can see that um, ATP falls off precipitously, as does velocity. Now, we typically talk in terms of distance. The time required for the male athletes that are in the biomechanical studies, less than 10 seconds. Your 13-year-old young female sprinter might be out there for 13 seconds. So you can see that the energetics is dependent on the time that they're producing maximum intensity movement. And so we need to take this into consideration relative to training. This is particularly true in the 400 and the 400 hurdles. You know, we're going to see a lot of people run 48 seconds in the 400 hurdle final for men. But if you look at your young developing athletes and they're running the 400 hurdles or the 400, they could be out there for 65 or 68 or even 70 seconds. And so understanding that that dynamic is dependent on time, not distance, and important when you're writing the training programs. Now, if we look at the untrained individual, this is kind of the curve that we see in terms of our, our uh, lactate. And that you see it really doesn't start until about three seconds. And it reaches a peak somewhere around eight seconds. And that peak, if we're looking at the... Uh, um, the left axis is the percentage of uh, resting. You'll see that it peaks out at about 45 or so. Remember we talked about high glycolytic power. This is the highly trained 100 uh, meter runner. And so you can see that our glycolytic system has been trained to kick in much, much sooner with our, with our uh, elite sprinters, could be partially because of fiber type. 
but there's also, there's also other considerations and the, the training actually gets the body to do this. But you can see the, the, the change in lactic, in lactate, the delta lactate. The rate is incredibly high, so the, the slope of the curve is almost vertical. And the amount of uh, lactate in the system of the 100 meter runner is extremely high. Now, when I was a young coach, we thought, well, you really don't develop um, very much lactate in the 100 meters, so we really don't need to concern with training this component. And the first person that I talked to was Elio Locatelli, who in 1995 um, took blood samples from the, the earlobe of the 100 meter runners at the national championships. And he found that they were in the range of 14 or 15 millimole. If he would have waited a little bit longer, he may have even found that it would be higher because sprinters don't clear lactate from the muscle as well as distance runners. To wait a little bit longer, it might have been higher. Some of the recent tests using more sophisticated uh, equipment will find 19, 20, 22 millimole after 100 meters. So glycolytic contribution is extreme. It, it happens soon, it happens fast, and there's a lot of it. And so understanding that there's a significant contribution there. So just to reinforce one more time, delta lactate is the change of the rate of change of lactic. Yeah. Sometimes you see peak. You see peak. Yeah, we have another mic. So the question was, um, do we have another? Yeah, thanks. The question was, what's the time frame that they should have waited? Uh, or perhaps should have waited in order to, to see the biggest changes in blood lactate. With sprinters, it's up to 20 minutes. Because again, you're, you're relying on pa more passive diffusion to get, get lactate out of the system. One of the key factors is how much creatine phosphate are you able to store in your muscle? And this is has been a huge bone of contention with, with one of my former athletes. You, sto you store about, if, if you don't eat any creatine, if you're, if you're a vegan, your muscle is gonna contain about one gram of creatine phosphate for every 100 grams of wet muscle. If you're an omnivore, which means you eat meat, you eat vegetables, that type of thing, as long as you don't overcook the meat. 140 degrees, creatine is what's called heat labile. It breaks apart at 140 degrees. So if you're a well done person, you might be destroying your creatine. Sushi's good, by the way. Fahrenheit, I'm sorry. I'm Fahrenheit, not, not, not Celsius. If you consume large amounts of sushi, you can get your, uh, or you supplement with a creatine supplement, you can get your uh, creatine levels up to four grams uh, per 100 um, grams of uh, wet muscle. That's significant. And so being able to have high level, and all of this research was done 100 years ago at the Karolinska Institute in uh, Sweden. But stored creatine phosphate is important. We talked about the creatine. There's, in many situations, athletes can be phosphate deficient. And so we want to make sure that they're eating the kind of foods, uh, oysters are great by the way, um, for high levels of phosphate so that we can make sure that they're combined. Just having a lot of free creatine around doesn't do us any good. So we can see that the stores of creatine are much, much higher than stores of ATP. We can increase creatine stores. It's very difficult to increase ATP stores. Now, 
Here's the textbook that I used uh, when I was studying with Bruno Balki and, and Dr. Fran Nagel, uh, Ustrand's uh, textbook of work physiology. And you can see, if we look at the distance, and again, I think they're talking about fairly high-level athletes. Um, they talked about, in 1971, 81.5% is anaerobic energy contribution to the performance in the 400 meters. 18.5% was attributed to aerobic contribution. And you could, I'm not gonna belabor this and read it all the way down, you can see that. But the key point here is what's happening with sprints, okay? Now you gotta understand, in the 1970s, we were collecting uh, every breath in a big uh, balloon called a Douglas bag, running over, having to test it and things like that, with more sophisticated technology and breath by breath evaluation and looking at blood levels, um, Gaston, who I'm going to use, many, of the, many other people have agreed with this, show that, um, gosh, the 400 meters is closer to 60% anaerobic and almost, you know, 40%, 43.5% aerobic contribution. Now, this is a bit of a shocker to many people. Bit of a shocker in the last 10 years. And I think the, the key point here is, uh, here's the other key point. There is a range depending on your fiber, your fiber, muscle fiber composition. And so, if you're more toward the, the type two fibers and you have a high concentration of type twos, it's probably gonna be a little bit more anaerobic contribution. If you have a greater component of, so if maybe you're a four eight runner, maybe you have a greater component of the intermediate fibers that, that, that can actually function in, in an oxidative state. If you, if you train them that way, it may be a slightly greater percentage. And so when we look at these things, we have to be able to respect that in the amount of training that we're doing. So if we're just doing sprints uh, and long sprints and heavy sprints through the whole year and we're not training the athlete aerobically, we're missing the boat in many cases. Okay, so the muscle cell and, and I think the first thing I want to point out here, although I'm not going to talk about it today, muscle protein can be used as a fuel. Okay? When you get in a situation where you're glycogen depleted, we can actually burn protein. We knock the ammonia off of the, uh, an amino acid, and it turns into a long chain carbon um, like, a, like a glycogen. Here's the problem. Ammonia is nasty when it's inside your muscles. The other thing is, if it's the working muscle that you're burning the protein from, you're starting to digest, basically, the, the tissue that's responsible for producing force. And so two things that we wanna do is wanna avoid uh, metabolizing protein and to get energy. But this is where we're gonna spend our time here for the next few minutes. Understanding the process of going from glycogen to pyruvate to lactate and the, and the energy cycle and things like that. Now, in these, next in these next slides, don't worry. You will not be tested on the terminology. In fact, a lot of the words on the slide will never come out of my mouth. Okay, but I want you to appreciate the, the sequence of events, the cascade of events that has to happen in glycolysis. And more importantly, where the heck does the acid come from? And how do we get the ATP? And why do we need magnesium again in this process? So, very quick response. We saw that in the slide relative to our elite sprinter versus our untrained sprinter and can be extremely high in terms of energy production, but because of the byproducts 
can actually shut down the contractile process. And we're going to look at where, where those points occur. The first step is we've got to somehow prepare the, the glucose or the glycogen to go, um, to go to work here. And so I know that the dot doesn't work on here, right? It works? Okay, where is it now? Uh huh. Okay, here's the, the key thing. It yields ADP, so it's we we need to burn energy in order to make this happen, right? So we're using energy to make energy. And here's the other guy here. Now, what happens here is we need the magnesium in that in that particular step of the reaction. Then we perform a little magic and move some things around, take one from here and stick it here, and then the next one is the PFK, the phosphofructokinase. And Dr. Hartman talked about this, is this is really the rate limiting step in terms of, um, in terms of the, the glycolytic cycle. And he also talked a little bit about the, the, the misconception that children don't necessarily have a lot of this enzyme. It's not as much as they will have in their adult life, but they can still produce, um, they can still produce acid in the, in the body, still produce lactate. One of the reasons I do not advocate special endurance training, which is pretty much full intensity at um, 85 to 95% intensity, over the, over the course of 20 to 30 seconds, 20 to 40 seconds, for a young athlete is who wants to run and run and run and then puke, throw up? Young kids don't want to go through that. We're better off looking at training their general capacities and their speed capacities and their coordinative capacities. We can layer on the other aspect as they get older. And so this is, this is one of the things where people talk about using grown-up programs and just giving them to kids. Yes? Somebody got the microphone? We need to get more speed training back there. <laughs> Hello. Um, at what age uh, for young kids? Um, is it under 14? It, it, depends, it depends on the level. I was discussing with Gunter after his trip to the... Uh, the, the Pan American, uh, was it ju junior championships? Um, and, and the performances that we're starting to see in the youth and the juniors, it, it kind of depends. It's 15, 16 years old, where you're, where you're really, your body is ready if it's been prepared right to actually train. Without, you know, trying to dodge that, that, that bullet there. But again, we're in this reaction, we get uh, more adenosine diphosphate, <laughs> and another hydrogen ion. And so here we go again, another big word. So the key point here is this yields uh, NADH and hydrogen, another hydrogen. Look at that. <coughs> and finally, ta-da, we get... Um, are ATP and pyruvate. Now, the key point in one of these reactions is it takes a six carbon molecule and splits it into two three chain carbon molecules. So when we get down to this, this last step, we're really getting two ATPs uh, out of the reaction and not just one. So when we look at uh, keeping score, the process of glycolysis actually consumes two ATP molecules, but yields four. So you got a net yield of two ATP molecules. The other thing, and here's the bad news, you know, good news, bad news kind of situation. Um, we're also generating um, hydrogen ions. Hydrogen, when it's running around in its uh, unassociated form, is basically functioning like an acid. 
it lowers the pH. And as the pH intramuscular goes down, it starts to gum up the, uh, the con muscle contraction. The first place that pH strikes, uh, low pH or high hydrogen ion concentration, is it inhibits phosphofructokinase. Again, the rate-limiting enzyme in glycolysis. So by producing more glycolysis, we get more hydrogen ions, and that feeds back and shuts down the key enzyme. The other thing that hydrogen ions do is it gets in the way of the, uh, the muscle contraction, the sliding filament. So as pH goes up, the myosin kinase doesn't work as well anymore, and the force of the contraction is reduced. And so we start to look at, okay, how are we going to manage this darn hydrogen ion? So we get to pyruvate. Pyruvate is what's supposed to go into the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, and go through the oxidative metabolism. But when the production of pyruvate goes over the capacity of the mitochondria to uh, go through that oxidative cycle, it starts to accumulate. And what happens is, in, on the right side, that's the animal version um, and not the yeast version, what happens is, is pyruvate grabs two hydrogen ions and turns itself into lactate. So lactate is not the bad guy, okay? Lactate is actually a fuel. But what it does is it tries to grab those two hydrogen ions, and then it tries to get out of the cell. It tries to take the hydrogen ions out of the cell with it. And so understanding that when the mitochondria can no longer keep up with the pace of pyruvate production, we're starting to get a and, and lactic acid, or lactate rather, we're starting to get more acid in the cell. When we get high acidity, acidity in the cell, we start to sh shut down muscle contraction. Now, here's the other key point. At some point in time, we need to have relaxation of the muscle. And in high-speed movement, high-speed cyclical movement, it's contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. And so it happens at an extremely high rate. What happens is, is when nerve stimulation stops, the calcium is reabsorbed from the spaces back into the, uh, the system by what we call the calcium pump, which, by the way, requires ATP in order to run that calcium pump. Type 2 B fibers are really good at calcium reabsorption. The other ones, type, type 1 fibers, or typically slow twitch, are not as good at it. So in order to get high speed changing between agonist and antagonist, it helps if this is, if, if this is uh, highly refined and particularly with fast twitch muscles. Here's the other thing, and I'm going to use this later that I need to tell you. It go, the calcium is released into the spaces and then is reabsorbed back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Some of it leaks out, okay? That's going to be important in a little while. Some of it leaks out. So pyruvate uh, accumulates insufficient oxidative capacity, decreases the intracellular pH, and therefore shuts down muscle function. Okay, how do we manage this acidity? There's primarily three ways. Lactate diffuses out of the cell into the blood. So down the concentration gradient. So you have high levels of lactate intracellularly, low levels in the blood. That will cause lactate to leave the system. When you start to fill the blood up, then diffusion doesn't work as well anymore because the concentration gradient isn't as steep. The key, and 
happens a little bit in the in the 400 meter running, but much more so in the longer events, is how do we get the lactate out of the blood? Well, the liver and the kidney are responsible for changing it back to glucose. But but wait a minute now. As we exercise, we increase the level of epinephrine, and that shunts the blood away from the kidneys and the liver. What muscles are not working as hard in sprinting or in running as the legs, the arms? So if you train your upper body aerobically, what happens is, well, if it's not trained aer aerobically, what happens? And I don't know if you've experienced this, if you've ever trained for 400 meters or 800 meters, but the, lactic the lactate passes from the blood into the more passive muscles of the arm that are not producing high levels of lactate. And have you ever felt where your arms are just heavy and almost hurt after a high intensity training session? That's why. If you train the upper body um, aerobically, cross-country skiers are probably the best at this. Uh, swimming is also another, arm ergometry is boring. But if you train the upper body aerobically, the lactate diffuses into the upper body and then is, is metabolized and, and burned there because now you've got mitochondria up here that are working. So you can modulate the level of blood lactate by doing more upper body aerobic kind of training. Um, buffering intracellular hydrogen ion accumulation. There's not many compounds that do this. Um, typically, our buffers, our buffering systems, and there's eight of them, uh, the bicarbonate buffering system is the, the one that's most talked about and the, and the biggest one, are all extracellular. Carnosine helps um, buffer intracellular lactic acid. And so, um, and there's been a lot of research now on, on, the, on the compound beta alanine. Um, to be able to facilitate that. And then um, the most recent um, information is talking about a specialized protein. Um, we're just going to call it MCT, and that's not medium chain triglycerides, which is also an interesting fuel. But they seem to think that there's a, an, a, an ability to actively transport um, lactate from the cell into the system. And um, you know, it's controlled by a certain gene, that particular protein. It's expressed in, uh, in white skeletal muscle fiber. And so this is, a, this is an, another thing that we need to look at relative to you know, training our, our sprinters, in particular our long sprinters. Let's just talk a little bit about adenylate kinase reaction. This is, this is the one where you take the two ADP molecules and smash them together, and you get um, an a ATP, but you also get an AMP. Now, what ends up happening is, is as um, ADP accumulates in the muscle, you start to get, and, and creatine accumulates in the muscle, you get changes in the energy dynamics, which interfere with um, the uh, phosphorylation of ADP to make it ATP. And so in these, in, these, uh, in these athletes, they can knock these two things together and you say, hey, great, another way to make ATP. Here's what's not so great. Um, AMP turns into IMP, which is inosine monophosphate. Now, if you're a reptile, you're happy about this because you can then use this to deliver energy to, uh, to rebuild ATP. We unfortunately cannot. And so what ends up happening is an inosine monophosphate then gets turned into ammonia. Oop, there's that ammonia. Remember we talked about that in terms of the uh, deaminization, the chopping off of the ammonia um, or the 
the NH uh, portion of the protein molecule. Ammonia is a poison, just like hydrogen ion. Can, ben Tabachnik told me many years ago, hydrogen ions are, is like poison. It'll actually interfere long term with the uh, oxidative process and oxidative enzymes. And so um, we want to try to control this. So one of the things we do periodically is we take um, little, little tabs that indicate ammonia and we just put, it on the, put some saliva on it and see what the ammonia levels are in the athlete. And we can see what kind of metabolic stress that they've been under. Okay, cessation of muscle contraction. You either um, run out of fuel, you have central nervous system fatigue, um, you voluntarily um, or consciously or unconsciously um, shut down. I'm going to be interested to hear tomorrow's presentation about the effect of the mind and the uh, thing. There's a uh, brilliant guy from South Africa that talks about the athlete's self-preservation model. If they think they're going to die, they stop. And so some athletes are have the ability to push through this thing. And again, sense, central neural control. I'm going to go kind of quick because I want to get to a couple things. Um, adaptation to aerobic training. These are the primary factors that uh, lead to adaptation of training. Intracellular calcium. Remember we talked about um, the calcium leaks out of the, out of the space into the cell? The longer the muscle contractions, the more calcium we get in the cell. Heat stress also uh, promotes uh, aerobic uh, adaptation. Increased ATP to ADP ratios, when ADP goes up, we, we can get a better adaptation. Glycogen depletion actually facilitates um, adaptation. Caloric restriction facilitates adaptation, and oxidative stress facilitates it. Now, in the second line, that is a particular little protein. There's supposed to be a little gamma signal behind it, but that is the activator. This is what controls um, how we're going to be able to increase the number of mitochondria in the cell, mitochondrial biogenesis. It also um, works with uh, angiogenesis, which is the proliferation of capillaries, not only in the muscles, but also in the lungs, so we get better ventilation to perfusion. And identifying the key stress points at which you're going to stress the athlete is important. Um, based on the energy systems. So, there should be low intensity training in here. So, okay, adaptation to lower intensity training. So, the, cal the longer the calcium is in the muscle, uh, the greater mitochondrial biogenesis we have. So, kind of the rationale for long, slow distance. What we do with our sprinters, um, when they come onto campus in the fall, we have the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. So we'll do a series of tests, bloods, we'll do um, you know, body composition, DEXA scans, we'll do power output tests. But the other thing we do is we do a treadmill test that everybody says, um, calls the fat max test. So basically you start out walking and we look to find the heart rate where metabolism changes from fat to carbohydrate. So this is called, that's the respiratory quotient at number one. Now, what they don't like is when we keep going and we see what happens to the blood lactate at, at certain paces. But we've developed the concept of the active dynamic warm-up. It's relatively low intensity to heart rate, but it can last an hour of continuous activity Varying, Pauline Davis is shaking her head because she knows exactly what that is. Varying uh, the intensity up and down around this, around this peak, around this point, heart rate for the individual. In this way, we're getting an aerobic stimulus. So that even, even 100 meter runners. So high intensity training, when we're starting to work at um, 
you know, faster, faster things, depletes our phosphocreatine. This is a this is a key trigger. Breaks down muscle glycogen, key trigger. Uh, AMP kinase is another activator that promotes the development of of uh, blood vessels, capillaries in the in the muscle. Lactate. Whenever we increase epinephrine, we're going to have a greater adaptation. And here's another thing I just want to and I'll maybe end on this, huh? What am I? I could talk another hour if you want me to. <laughs> so there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there about uh, in supplementation about antioxidants. Um, the antioxidants that you get from your food probably a good thing. But if you're supplementing, particularly around training, with synthetic antioxidants, what you're doing is you're going to blunt the response of this oxidative stress. And consequently, your adaptation to aerobic training will be less. And so um, that's just a review of what I said. Let's talk about diet for a second. So how can, how can we facilitate um, affecting the mitochondrial adaptation by our diet. You know, we heard that refueling is really important. However, carbohydrate res restriction of carbohydrate intake actually, and then training, will actually stimulate the development of the mitochondria better. So ingesting zero um, carbohydrate with a little bit of caffeine uh, and no antioxidants Increases calcium release, it promotes uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, and increases epinephrine. Performed low intensity uh, for long duration. Um, the other thing is, is that if we use these strategies excessively, it has to be every so often, you actually decrease immune system function. And then the last thing is, what do we, what do we want to look at in terms of fueling the body in preparation for competition? We have to make sure that carbohydrate is high in, in the body. You know, I, remember, I remember we were testing some, an athlete, and they said, look, this, this is amazing. There's no lactate in his blood. He's working hard, but there's no lactate. I said, you dang idiot, he doesn't have any glycogen to burn. And so um, real important that we have the proper fuels available. We talked about the vegan diet. I can't emphasize this enough that you need to somehow figure out how to get creatine in your body. And magnesium intake is real important. Thank you for your time this morning. Looking forward to coming back and, and joining Raina and uh, answering some questions. Some questions from your side. Let me open with one practical question, Lauren. My athlete, 400 meter is slowing down the last 150 meters. So what would be your understanding? What are the most common reason? And what would you do in training? The background is, I heard this discussion yesterday. Ah, look at him. He has no acidose tolerance. I need to work on his ability to maintain a high level. What is missing? What is lacking most likely in this reduction of Speed. So when, when you see this happening, the, the first question you have to ask is, was the pace of the first part of the race excessive for that particular athlete? And so if we're talking about 400 meters, and one of my, one of my young athletes, the first time she made to the semifinal of the, of the um, world championships in the 400, she was in lane nine. I told her, I said, just run, run your race. That's where you ran your PR was nobody else was around you. You were able to focus. She felt so good that, you know, her best time this year in the, in the 200 without extra wind was 23.5. She ran through in 23.7. Needless to say, she was not able to sustain. She just ran out of, ran out of gas and the accumulation of... It's like somebody sticking a potato in your tailpipe of your car. It makes it doesn't work. So um, the other thing is, is that they're not getting a big enough aerobic share. So you look, at, you look at both sides of the glycolytic system. 
one of, my, one of my former athletes, if this happened to her, it's because she was not getting a big enough anaerobic A lactate share because of stored creatine phosphate. The other, the other place where you need to change the anaerobic share, especially based on the new information by Gaston and so many others, is you need to have a better aerobic preparation. They need to be able to oxidize a lot, a lot better. And so, and then the last thing is to be able to make sure that their, their glycolytic system is, is working properly and that their, their, their fuels are, are high enough. Just, just doing more spe speed in, or special endurance doesn't necessarily give you the desired result. Yeah. Going back on the question about lactate and the context of time, if, if we're looking at 15, 20 minutes, like you say, if those are going to be the highest, concentrate, uh, the highest concentration of lactate, what does that say for the rest period? Where should we be? If we run an all-out 100 meters, say, in training, what should we be looking at in terms of rest? Should we be looking at 25 minutes? Does, does, does that make sense? Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, it does. Great. Um, so a couple, couple different uh, things to your question. Um, if you're doing pure neuromuscular work, you want to have uh, lactate levels relatively low. The key point is, how can you clear lactate the best? And so if 100 meters, but even a little bit longer, 150, 250, that kind of thing, um, if the athlete just lays down, they are not going to clear lactate very well. The best way to clear lactate is somewhere with a heart rate between 120 and 140, depending on the athlete. This is, this is the heart rate that we look at, kind of the zone one heart rate that we establish with our fat max test. So the athlete has to do an active recovery in order to be able to, to clear lactate the best. But in some cases, you don't want necessarily, you know, 100% uh, um, hundred percent reduction back to back to normal, but the um, we use depending on the duration of exposure, we go between ten and twenty minutes relative to high intensity rest. Question over here: um, You mentioned earlier that um, calcium is involved in the initial muscle contraction and magnesium calcium. Yes and magnesium is also required. But are they both consumed? Are they both? Consumed. Um, they're not consumed, but for example, the magnesium is used to shield the positive charge on the, the phosphate. If that's not there, then you don't have the, the, the muscle contraction. And calcium, calcium sets off the cascade, but is reabsorbed. But some of it leaks into the muscle, leaks out, gets into the blood, we sweat it out, that type of thing. So that's why we want to look at making sure we replenish those two, uh, those two minerals. Um, I'm not familiar with the uh, ammonia measurement during, in, in saliva. How do you incorporate it in, in your training? What kind of workouts are you using it with? And when do you measure the Mostly, time, time frame? Yeah, I'm not. So, Basically, it's called a nitro stick. So you, you just put the saliva on, and it, and it gives you the rough concentration of ammonia. We're more using it to look at long-term long recovery and what's happening in the body, and not necessarily after, like, a, a run. Like long-term, like a couple hours or next morning? Days, yeah. like a day. Yeah. And we're, we're also using omega wave in terms of heart rate variability, EEG evaluation. Um, I had a company build some accelerometers into some shoes, so we do like a five jump test, um, and it you know put that into the the equation, and it tells it tells us more about trainability. What 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 should we train today? 